Hello and welcome to another Arlington High School Math for Honors lesson. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 1, Lesson Number 6 on the Zero Product Law. Like all lessons in Unit Number 1, this is a review lesson, so we're not starting the Zero Product Law from scratch. But it is a very, very important equation solving technique. I would rank it as number two only to solving equations using inverses. So let's review the zero product law. All right. The zero product law is based on a very, very important property of multiplication. And it's, it's, a, it's a property that everyone should feel very comfortable with. If I'm multiplying two or more quantities together and the result of that product is equal to zero, then one part of the product or both parts of the product must be equal to zero. There is no other number like zero, all right? It is the zero product law. In other words, there is no 12 product law, right? If I knew that a times b was equal to 12, well, a doesn't have to be 12, right? b doesn't have to be 12. There's no 12 product law. You know, if a times b is equal to 20, there's no 20 product law, right? a could be 2, b could be equal to 10. So there's no 20 product law. But if I know that two or more things in a product are equal to zero, then either A is equal to zero, or B is equal to zero, or C is equal to zero, etc. Notice that word or. It's not an and issue. It's not that A has to be zero and B has to be zero. It's that at least one of them does. So let's move on and review how this can be used to solve certain types of equations. Certain types, not all types. Anyhow, I'm going to clear out the screen, so pause the video if you need to. Here we go. All right, let's do it. So in exercise number one, it asks us to solve the following equations. And here's where we utilize the zero product law, right? Right here, we've got the product of this quantity times this quantity equal to zero. So what we know is that either 2x minus 1 must be equal to zero, or 3x plus 5 must be equal to zero. What we've done is we've taken a more complicated equation and turned it into two simpler equations, right? This guy and this thing. So you don't get something for nothing ever in life. Um, the zero product law always works out this way. You exchange one more complicated equation for two or more simpler equations. But now we can solve these equations by just applying inverses, right? We invert the addition by one, we invert the multiplication, and we get x equals one half likewise subtract 5 from both sides, and divide by 3, and we get x equals negative 5 thirds. All right. For my students in Math for Honors, if they can go from the factored form to the final solutions, I'm completely okay with that. Other teachers, though, may want to see those individual steps to get the 1 half and the negative 5 thirds. Now, I love the name zero product law because it implies two things. It implies that you have a product, and that that product is equal to zero. In letter B, we've got something equal to zero, so we have half of the, uh, the sort of requirement, but what we don't have is a product yet, all right? And of course, we're going to get a product by factoring this. Now, this is not a lesson in factoring, but this is a trinomial, all right? And it's a pretty easy trinomial. There are no GCFs. Obviously, the first two terms have to be 3x and x, and maybe I would have to play around with this a little bit. Um, what might I have? Maybe I would have a negative 7 and a positive 2. Does that work? Well, let's see. 2x, whoops, that doesn't look like a 2x. Whoops, negative 21x, those sum to be negative 19x, so that's correct. All right, I'm going to erase that, though, because I need to have a little bit of space to actually do the zero product law. Once I have this product equal to zero, we're really back to letter A. We'll have 3x plus 2 equal to zero. Eventually, we'll solve and get negative 2 thirds. And we'll have x minus 7 is equal to zero. We'll solve that, and we'll get 7. Again, I'm instructing at an honors pre-calculus level. So I'll assume that students understand why I'm getting negative 2 thirds and why I'm getting 7 at that point. Now in letter C, we've got sort of the, the full picture, which is that we've got an equation. It's not set equal to zero, nor is it factored. So the first thing I'm going to do is get it equal to zero. I'm going to do that by subtracting 9x and adding 18 to both sides of this equation. All right. That's going to end up giving me 4x cubed minus 8x squared 
minus 9x plus 18 is equal to 0. Make sure you don't lose the equal to 0 for honor students. All right, don't turn a cat into a dog. Don't take an equation and turn it into an expression, in other words. Now we have to look to factor this. So one of those four factoring techniques kicks in, and it's factoring by grouping. So with the first two terms, let me actually circle them in red. For these two terms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out a 4, and I'm going to be able to pull out an x squared. And I'm going to be left with x minus 2. All right, let me go with another color. Let's go with black on the second one. Now remember, if factoring by grouping is going to work at all, I have to have an x minus 2. So if I factor out a negative 9, not a positive 9, then I'll have that x minus 2 that I need. All right, we now see with factoring by grouping that we've got that x minus 2 in both of them. I'm going to go back to blue. So I'm going to factor the x minus 2 out. That's going to leave me with a 4x squared minus 9 equals 0. You could continue to factor the 4x squared minus 9, but my claim is that's kind of a waste of time, given that in 4x squared minus 9, x only shows up once. The whole purpose here is to change an equation where we can't use inverses to solve it into ones where we can. So in other words, I can take x minus 2, I can set it equal to 0, and obviously get a very simple solution, x equals 2. But I can also take 4x squared minus 9 and set it equal to 0, and sure, I can, I can certainly factor that, but I can also just apply inverses, eventually getting me x squared, or what should look like an x squared, equals 9 fourths, x then would be plus or minus the square root of 9 fourths, so x would be plus or minus 3 halves. All right. Now we've got some more challenging ones coming up in just a second in exercise 1, but I'd like you to pause the video now and write down any of this work that you didn't catch as I was going along. All right, we're going to get rid of it. Scrubbing the text. Let's continue with exercise 1. The last two in exercise 1 push us a little bit to understand the structure of factoring a little bit better. So when we see something like x minus 8 times root x plus 12 equals 0, it almost seems, at first blush, that we might have to isolate the square root, square both sides, etc. But we can actually factor this if we understand the pattern of trinomial factoring. You see, I know that root x times root x is going to give me x to the first. And that's a good thing because it also happens to be the power of the middle term, right, or the second term, or however you want to put it. Right? I can then factor this as minus 6 and minus 2, and it does work out, right? I'll have negative 2 root x and negative 6 root x, and I think I'll leave those. Those give me that negative 8 root x. That means I now have root x minus 2 is equal to 0, and root x minus 6 is equal to 0. I'll add 2 to both sides. I'll get root x is equal to 2. Square both sides. Remember, don't take the square root to get rid of a square root. That doesn't work. I'll get x equals 4. Whoops, that doesn't make any sense. Let's get rid of that. Here, I'll have root x is equal to 6. and I'll square both sides, and I'll get x is equal to 36. Again, don't hesitate to check those answers, right? With square root equations especially, I'm wary about extraneous roots. Those are both very, very fine answers, so no issue there, but it doesn't hurt to check. Now, probably d might be even a little bit easier than e. A lot of students will get thrown off by fractional exponents and things like that, understandably so, by the way. But letter e, it's not too bad. In fact, why don't you pause the video now and make an attempt at letter e on your own. All right, let's go through it. Well, notice here, x to the 8th is x to the 4th squared, right? And that's kind of the deal when you have trinomial factoring. That second lower powered term has to be the square root of that first term. Otherwise, trinomial factoring isn't going to work. But I'll have x to the 4th times x to the 4th equals x to the 8th. And I'll have minus 1 and minus 16. And we could go through the check, but we'll, we'll see that it works out right. Now again, we could continue to factor. There's nothing wrong with that. Or, since x only shows up once in each of these, we could go directly to x to the 4th minus 1 equals 0, x to the 4th equals 1, and then we could take the 4th root of both sides. Oops. Let me put the 1 back right there. And we'll get x equals plus or minus 1. That's important. We'll get x to the 4th minus 16 equals 0 x to the 4th equals 16, take the 4th root of both sides, 
and x will be plus or minus 2. All right. Again, there's nothing wrong with continuing to factor x to the fourth minus 1 into x squared plus 1, x squared minus 1, etc. But since x only shows up once, why not just use inverses at that point? All right. Pause the video now, write down anything you need to, then we're scrubbing out the text. All right, let's do it. Moving on, back side of the sheet. All right, exercise two says solve the following fractional equations for all values of x. Now, with fractional equations, uh, ultimately what you're almost always trying to do is get rid of the fractions. And there's two major techniques for getting rid of fractions. It's either cross-multiplying or multiplying both sides of the equation by a quantity that will cancel out all denominators. Now, the purist would say that those two actually are the same technique, and the purist would be right. But most students will look at letter A and they'll say to themselves, all right, you know, I've got a cross multiply. That will give me x minus 4 times x plus 3 on the left side. It'll give me 2 times x plus 8 on the right side. Of course, I have to be able to square that out correctly. But again, this is pre-calculus honors. So we're going to do that in our head. Now we just need to get our equation equal to zero. Apparently in silence. It's not easy to talk, write, all of that at the same time, but doable. Right? It's, uh, yeah, it all works, and x minus 7 equals 0, x plus 4 equals 0, x equals 7, x equals negative 4. All right, so simple cross multiplying. You could have seen that problem easily in Algebra 1, especially the new Common Core Algebra 1. Actually, no, Common Core Algebra 1 doesn't have rational equations in it. But let's take a look at letter B. All right, in letter B, we could certainly do cross multiplying if we managed to combine these two terms so they were just one fraction. But the technique that I like to use in this particular problem is multiplying both sides of the equation by the same quantity, obviously that's a property of equality, and multiplying it by something that will cancel both an x squared and a 2x. The simplest thing, the simplest thing would be to multiply both sides of this equation by 2x squared. Now, the left-hand side, we have to remember to distribute that, and of course 2x squared times 1 is 2x squared. When we multiply it here, the x squareds will cancel, and we'll get 2 times negative 10, which will be negative 20. On this side of the equation, the 2s will cancel, and a single x will cancel, and we'll be left with 3 times x. At that point, we've gotten rid of our fractions. So we might as well just get everything equal to 0. 2x squared minus 3x minus 20 equals 0. All right, again, not a lesson necessarily in factoring, but certainly one where you can get some practice. Let's see, that'll give me an 8 and a 5. I need a, I need a negative 3, so we're going to want that 5 to be pop. That's weird. We're going to want that 5 to be positive, the 8 to be negative. And again, here we'll have x equals negative 5 halves, and here we'll have x equals 4. All right. So I'm really kind of motoring through this because, again, at this level, this topic should be very, very much review from at least two, if not three, courses. So pause the video now. Think about what I did, what you did, and then we'll move on. All right. We have one more exercise in exercise number two, right? And here we've got a fractional equation set equal to zero, all right? <clears throat> and the key here is that if you have a fraction equal to zero, the only way that will happen is if the numerator is equal to zero, and this is key, and the denominator isn't equal to zero. All right, so we'll start off solving this equation by just laying this out, right? We're going to set the numerator equal to zero. There's no way, there's no way setting the denominator equal to zero will force the fraction equal to zero. Quite frankly, if the denominator is equal to zero, we can't really do much. So what do we have here? Well, let's try a 5x and a 2x, and let's try a negative 1 and a negative 1. Let's see, that'll give me negative 2x, negative 5x, it's negative 7x. Excellent, we'll get x equals 1 fifth, 
and x equals one half. Now the only question is, would either one of those make the denominator zero? Right? We have to be very wary about that. Actually, let me let, stay in red. All right. So whenever we're solving a fractional equation set equal to zero, we want to make sure that none of the answers that we get will make the denominator equal to zero. So in this case, one-fifth and one-half are valid because the only things that make the denominator equal to zero are negative four and positive three. Now I don't want to claim that those are answers. These are not answers. They are not solutions. Let me put it more bluntly. They're not solutions. Okay, but we needed to check it to make sure, make sure that the solutions we did get didn't make that denominator equal to zero. All right, pause the video again if you need to, and then we're going to clear out the text. All right, let's do it. All right, well, we had a little bit of glitch there. You may have noticed it. Let's do the last exercise. In the last exercise, what we're going to be doing is solving a system of equations. Now, the way that we solve a system of equations is we're going to substitute one equation into the other. Please don't get so hung up on the idea of setting equations equal that you do something weird like solve the equation of the circle for y. That's going to get real ugly real fast. Now, one thing that I have to do is I actually have to FOIL this out, right? I have to find out what 2x plus 3 times 2x plus 3 is. I do that on my side of my paper somewhere, right? I do it right in the problem. That would be okay as well. But what I don't do is distribute the squaring. I actually have to FOIL out. All right, so I'm going to have x squared plus 4x squared plus 12x plus 9 is equal to 4. I'm going to have 5x squared plus 12x. I'm going to bring the 4 over there right away. Plus 5. Oops, that's not a 4. That's a 41. Sorry about that. Let me get rid of that. I'm like, that doesn't sound even vaguely familiar to me. Um, so now, ah, uh, it's all falling apart. Minus 32, right? 9 minus 41, negative 32 equals 0. We can now factor we'll have 5x minus 8 and x plus 4. Let's just check. Negative 8, positive 20, positive 12. And we'll have x equals 8 fifths and x equals negative 4. This might actually be more convenient as a decimal. And of course, if we've got something like this, this one's not bad. Figure out y is simple enough, right? Because it will just be 2 times negative 3. Mistake palooza this morning. It's horrible. Neg 2 times negative 4 plus 3 gives me negative 8 plus 3 gives me negative 5. So one coordinate intersection point is negative 4, negative 5. The other one not as nice, right? y equals 2 times 1.6 minus 3. Let me just do a little cheat sheet there. 6.2. So 1.6 and 6.2. All right, so solving a system of equations. Okay, pause the video now, write down anything you need to on this problem, and then we'll finish up the lesson. All right, here goes the text. All right, so solving equations that have only have a variable in them only once by using inverses is undoubtedly the most important equation solving technique. A close second, though, is the zero product law, because it allows us to take many equations where the variable shows up more than once, get those equations equal to zero, factor them, and then set each factor equal to zero. Now, obviously, if an equation is not factorable once set equal to zero, the zero product law doesn't even apply. All right. So again, it's a very special, special subset, um, but it is in a very, very important law. And I want my Math for Honor students to be biased towards it, meaning that if a variable shows up more than once, the first thing I want you to try is the zero product law. If that fails, we'll go on to other techniques. All right. Well, I want to thank you for joining me for another Arlington High School Math for Honors lesson. Until next time, my name is Kirk Weiler. Keep thinking and keep solving problems.